Nicola Coughlin has a really interesting sex scene stipulation in her Bridgerton contract. I've never heard of anything like this before, but honestly, good for her. Have you ever wondered how actors bear the thought of having their parents watch them in R-rated scenes? Like, Emma Stone's parents probably saw poor things. Anyway, we all know that Bridgerton can get pretty steamy, and as the lead of season three, Nicola Coughlin just revealed her solution to this parents problem. As she just told Sirius XM, Coughlin has it written into her contract that Netflix and Shondaland must provide a PG-rated cut of the show for her to show her parents. Quote, it's literally written into my contract. People think I'm like saying it as a joke. I grew up Irish Catholic. That's just not how we vibe. Problem solved, I guess. Just mandate the show cut out all of your compromising scenes so that you have a clean version to show your family. I really wonder if any actors out there have this in their contract as well. Coughlin also explained that the show's adult content caught her mom off guard at first, saying when she first saw Bridgerton, she didn't know it was going to be so saucy. But... Now she thinks it's fantastic and really funny, and she keeps talking about bottoms. This being Bridgerton, expect Coughlin to have a bunch of saucy scenes with her co-star, Luke Newton, and some might be a little bit extreme even, as she also said, we did break a piece of furniture while doing one of those scenes. Just don't tell her mom and dad about it. Okay, I'm doing an emergency Friday night video because this is some really wild movie news. Deadline is reporting today that a Chris Farley biopic is in the works and that it's going to star Paul Walter Hauser. But wait till you hear who's directing and writing. I think Hauser is a great choice to play Farley. Not only is he an incredible actor with an Emmy and a Golden Globe on his mantle, he has the right physicality and has shown range from drama to comedy. Hauser actually tried to get a Farley biopic off the ground in 2021 and reportedly approached the late actor's family about making it, but it never materialized. Until now. This project has Farley's family's full blessing and will be based on the biography, The Chris Farley Show, a biography in three acts, co-written by Farley's brother, Tom Farley Jr. and Tanner Colby. But what's really wild is that Josh Gad, who's also a funny man with echoes of Chris Farley in him, will be making his directorial debut on the project. And if that wasn't enough, Scott Neustadter and Michael H. Weber, the guys who wrote 500 Days of Summer and adapted Daisy Jones and the Six for TV, are going to write the screenplay. Oh, and also Lauren Michael will be producing. That's enough talent to sell me a ticket. Shrek 2 returned to the box office charts this weekend. Yes, that Shrek 2. The classic DreamWorks sequel is celebrating its 20th anniversary next month. So in honor of that, Universal gave the movie a theatrical re-release this past weekend. And this wasn't some limited thing either. According to Slash Film, the movie played on more than 1,500 screens and earned a cool $1.35 million, meaning it landed at number nine in the box office top 10. Pretty impressive for a 20 year old movie. But sadly, it wasn't enough to push the movie over the 1 billion mark. Shrek 2's all-time total is now sitting at just north of 930 million worldwide. Fun fact, this is the first time in 14 years that a mainline Shrek movie, not a spin-off, has made the box office charts. And because Kung Fu Panda is still going strong, now at $452.6 million worldwide, DreamWorks Animation had two movies in the top 10. But if this proves one thing over anything else, it's that Shrek is eternal, Shrek is everlasting, and DreamWorks would be silly to not make a Shrek 5 or at least another Puss in Boots movie. The reviews for the Amy Winehouse biopic Back to Black are in, and uh, it's not looking good. First, let's see what the good things critics are saying about the movie. A lot of critics are praising Marissa Abela's performance. Total Film calls the actress superb, saying she truly inhabits Winehouse and brings those songs to life. And Variety says she nails Amy Winehouse in every look, mood, utterance, and musical expression. Some critics also praise the movie for being sympathetic and affecting. But almost all of the reviewers agree that the movie is flawed. The Daily Mail says, All the usual sins of biopics are committed here, only more so. One critic called the movie salacious and cruel. The London Evening Standard critic Hamish McBain said that the film's final scene made him physically gasp in horror. Perhaps the most damning review comes from Dexerto, which said, Back to Black is Amy Winehouse's Bohemian Rhapsody, but worse, it's not unwatchable, but there's no good reason to watch it either. It currently holds a 53% on Rotten Tomatoes with 17 reviews and a 4.5 out of 10 average rating. The Joker 2 trailer might be hiding a big twist in plain sight. The trailer for Joker Folie Adieu finally dropped last night, featuring the return of Joaquin Phoenix's Arthur Fleck and Lady Gaga's debut as Harley Quinn. And in the trailer, it seems director Todd Phillips has changed Harley Quinn's origin story. Harley first made her 
appearance in Batman the Animated Series, quickly becoming a popular addition to the Dark Knight's rogues gallery, even spawning her own series and live-action film appearances. The character's cartoon and comics origin story is that she's an Arkham Asylum psychologist with the Joker as one of her patients. Until he manipulates her, she falls in love with him and becomes one of his sidekicks. The new Joker 2 trailer changes this slightly. While Harley and the Joker still seem to be falling in love, it appears in the film Harley is not an Arkham doctor, but instead an inmate alongside Arthur. At least that's what it seems. But one shot has me thinking otherwise. At the 33 second mark, we see a free Harley walking the streets of the city. This is cut in with scenes of her otherwise at the asylum as a patient. This doesn't seem to be a dream sequence, like the other clearly stylized fantasies throughout the trailer, and her appearance matches pretty closely what she looks like on the inside. So my theory is Harley is lying. She really is still a psychologist, and she's actually undercover as a patient to get close to Arthur. And I bet when the Joker finds out about that, he's not gonna like it. That said, I could be way off, and this could be a shot from before or after she's been institutionalized. Guess we'll find out on October 4th. The gunshot sounds in Civil War were explicitly designed to terrify you. Here's what Alex Garland did differently than most movies. While not a horror movie, Civil War's imagined American conflict is scaring the bejesus out of everybody who's seen it. Except Variety's Owen Gleiberman, who went out of his way to write an article saying why he wasn't scared by the movie. Anyway, part of this is because the violence in the film is really in your face, and especially in your ears, which director Alex Garland did on purpose, by trying not to tamper too much with what the guns actually sound like. As he told Slash Film, what we did was we used exactly those noises. We used guns that fired blanks, and we put full flash blanks in them, and we recorded that noise as faithfully as we could. Garland explains that often when you hear gunfire in films, it's modified to put your subconscious at ease. Quote, in film, sometimes we'll do little tricks to do with using sub bass or extra noises, and what those extra sounds do is they slightly distance you from the stark aggressive sound of an automatic weapon firing. Film has a way sometimes of being subtly reassuring within the context of action or violence. And what we did was, where possible, try to remove those reassurances as much as possible. Yeah, I'd say mission accomplished on that. If you saw my review of Civil War, you know I was a little mixed on the movie. But I will say the sound design is exactly how he's describing. Aggressive and horrifying. Stunt performers are finally getting some of the respect they deserve. As the Fall Guy has invented a brand new credit for stunt leads. Usually the head stunt people on a film set are given the title stunt coordinator. But the new Ryan Gosling movie, which is literally about a stunt person, will introduce the title of stunt designer, giving it to industry veteran Chris O'Hara. Per the press release, this edition of the stunt designer moniker better encompasses the multifaceted nature of the profession. Director David Leach's production company pushed for this new title to accurately reflect the high level artistic contribution of world-class stunt coordinators like O'Hara. These are artists who do more than coordinate the logistics of stunts, they design and create them. He then praised Universal for allowing this groundbreaking new title, and hoped it would pave the way for the stunt industry to get the recognition it deserves. Hell yes. And perhaps this could finally lead the Oscars to also recognizing stunt people. According to The Wrap, one of the stumbling blocks of the Academy not creating a stunt category has been choosing who's actually going to be nominated. Margot Robbie has found yet another simulation of life to turn into a movie. The first, Margot Robbie made Barbie into one of the biggest films of all time. Then it was announced that her production company company Lucky Chap would be producing a movie adaptation of The Sims. And now it's been announced that her production company is coming on board a Monopoly movie with Lionsgate. Because if you could buy it at a Toys R Us, Margot Robbie wants to turn it into a movie. Robbie is not going to star in The Sims, and it's unclear if she'd appear in Monopoly either, but my guess is that she'll just be a producer on the latter project as well. It's still early going for Monopoly, as Variety says they don't even have a story yet. But the head of Lionsgate announced at CinemaCon that Lucky Chap has a clear point of view on Monopoly. Just speculating here, but I could see a world where Margot and company apply the same social conscience to Monopoly that they did for Barbie, perhaps using the notoriously capitalistic game as a way to talk about wealth inequality. And that could be something worth passing go for. This new Ninja Turtles project is exactly how Hollywood should be approaching its old IP. In a kind of shocking announcement on Thursday, Paramount revealed that it's developing a live action R-rated Ninja Turtles movie based on the franchise's popular comic book storyline, The Last Ronin. In case you're not aware, The Last Ronin is set in an autocratic future New York City. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, big spoiler alert here, and features Shredder's grandson and his army of synthetic ninjas, 
killing off Splinter and the turtles one by one. Except one turtle manages to survive, and with all four of the team's weapons, seeks revenge on the enemies. Part of the hook of the book is that for the majority of the story, we don't know which turtle is the surviving member. First released between 2020 and 2022, the miniseries was a big hit. Its collected paperback became the second highest grossing graphic novel of 2023. And IDW just released a sequel series, The Last Ronin 2, Re-Evolution. If Hollywood is going to insist on wringing out every last bit of juice from its major franchises, it should at least be trying to infuse some creativity and originality into that storytelling. And Paramount is clearly doing that here, giving us a new and compelling story that hasn't been told on screen yet, one with a distinct and original vision from a sandbox we already know and love. To do The Last Ronin in live action and to keep it R-rated is a risky choice especially considering the franchise has mostly been aimed at children over the years. But the kids that first got into it have grown up, and so to appeal to them with a little bit of aged-up reinvention is just smart filmmaking. Paramount is thinking outside the box while still remaining close enough to the box for it to still be recognizable. Honestly, it reminds me a lot of Deadpool and Andor. And if done right with commitment and consistent vision, it could show the entire industry just how it should be reinventing its franchises. The number of sequels and reboots announced this week has been absolutely head spinning. CinemaCon is currently going on, where the studios show the exhibitors all the big stuff that they have planned for theaters. And with that, it's been sequels and reboots as far as the eye can see. Blumhouse and Lionsgate announced that they're bringing back the Blair Witch Project. Paramount is making a live action R-rated movie of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Last Ronin. It also officially announced the Transformers G.I. Joe crossover movie. Glenn Powell has just been cast in Edgar Wright's remake of The Running Man. Paramount is also bringing back the Scary Movie franchise. Meanwhile, Universal officially, officially announced the Five Nights at Freddy's sequel, which is eyeing a 2025 release date, though I'm sure there are some Five Nights at Freddy's fans out there who are going to tell me that the sequel had already been greenlit. It had not. This is the official announcement that it's coming. Danny Boyle is directing 28 Years Later, which had already been announced, but now we know that the Marvel's director, Nia DaCosta, is in talks to direct the sequel to that movie. The animated sequel film to Avatar The Last Airbender, Aang The Last Airbender, is heading to theaters in October of 2025. Oh, and over on TV, they're doing another reboot of Melrose Place with some of the original cast, and another reboot of Heroes is in the works. So I hope you like sequels and reboots. Civil War's most chilling scene came together at the last second. If you've seen the movie, you know exactly which one I'm talking about. Hell, if you've just seen the trailer, you probably also know it. It's when the photojournalists come upon Jesse Plemons. And without spoiling too much here, they're thrust into a life or death situation. Plemons, who has plenty of experience playing deranged characters, seems perfect for this part and brings a truly ominous presence. His line delivery of what kind of American are you just about sums up the movie. But get this, he wasn't supposed to be in the movie at all. According to a new interview director Alex Garland did with the Los Angeles Times, another actor was set for the scene, but dropped out at the last minute. Garland recalls being in rehearsals for the movie and said, when I got the call, I thought, oh shit, now we're in trouble. So he went back into the rehearsal and told the other actors, bad news guys, so-and-so can't do it. But that's when Kirsten Dunst had an idea. You should ask Jesse, who also happens to be her husband. And Garland thought that was amazing. According to Dunst, Plemons was around and able to do it. And do it, he did. Plemons absolutely crushed it. To which Garland said, it was a stunning bit of good luck. The film was very lucky to get Jesse. Yeah, I'd say.